It is Thursday night in East Lansing. Actually, it's Wednesday night in East Lansing, Michigan. My name is Jim Comperoni, publisher, SpartanMag.com. Come on in, gather around, gather around. Make sure to behave yourselves. We're going to have fun talking Michigan State sports. It's been a couple weeks. Ready to roll again. Michigan State with some news today. Commitment from an offensive lineman. We will talk about that later. Also, we will take your questions over there in the chat area. And what we do on Spartan Mag Live is we read your questions that were posted at the Underground Bunker message board over at SpartanMag.com. I am publisher of SpartanMag.com, which is the Michigan State site covering Spartan football, Spartan basketball, recruiting for Rivals.com. And the Underground Bunker message board is the church of what's happening now in Michigan State sports. There you will find the daily narrative on Spartan sports, Michigan State sports, from Michigan State fans all over the country, all over the world, every day, all the time. And today we were talking recruiting because Michigan State got a commitment. We will talk about that, like I said, in a few minutes. Our Spartan Maggers, they posted questions over at the Underground Bunker message board earlier today. I will be tackling those questions, having a good time doing it. It's a great day in the state of Michigan. 76 rock and roll over degrees. I think Arthur Penhall used to say that. Those of you that know who he is or was, you might not appreciate that because he was a Michigan fan, but grew up listening to that guy. And summertime was great when it was when it was warm. And it was warm today. Not too hot. It was good in East Lansing. And the sun over there on the west side of the state, as you look at this at the west side of the stadium, the sun has set over Lake Michigan on a gorgeous Wednesday, June 16th. 79 days away from kicking off the 2021 college football season on time this year. 79. How do I know that? Some gentleman posted on Twitter today. They've got that daily countdown, how many days till kickoff, and they use a different jersey number to commemorate a past player as part of the countdown. Today it was 79. Tony Mandrich posted a a photo of Tony Mandrich with the man who recruited him, Mr. Nick Saban. Mandrich from Ontario, Canada, played high school ball in Ohio. That was Saban's recruiting territory. Saban recruited him. And those two guys made a lot of history. Saban is still making history. Anyway, uh, let's go right to the questions. Let's go right to them. Question number one from MSU Polo from Rockford, Michigan. Excuse me. He says, He says, thanks, Jim. Good to have live back. My question is about in-state recruiting. That seems to be the main line in the sand between the different factions at the Underground Bunker message board. Specifically, if Mel Tucker and his staff are doing enough to prioritize in-state recruiting. Would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, I didn't know that this was being argued on the Underground Bunker message board. Hey, Tucker is going to go after the players he sees that can help him. The the proper frame, explosiveness, strength, athletic ability, disposition, all those things. And he will go after them as soon as they identify somebody on film, whether they're in Texas, New Mexico, California, or Muskegon. As soon as it's a guy that they think is their type of guy, they're going to offer and, and build relationships from there. Now they're not going to find, um, you know, they've got some pretty strong specifications, high standards, and they are not going to find all of their players that meet their frame and athleticism standards in the state of Michigan. I think this year, right now, there might be 12 or 13 players for the class of 2022 that had or have Michigan State offers, maybe a few more. So they prioritize those guys, go after them. Some of those guys got offers, and then Michigan State kind of scaled back their interest maybe after seeing their junior season. Some of those guys were offered... Hold on a second. I'm going to bring the stand up here a little bit. It's in, might be my way a little... Yeah, that's, that's fine. It's fine. It covers part of my face. That's fine. I'll be like Tim Allen's neighbor on Home Improvement. But, you know... A couple of guys were offered after, the, after their sophomore film, and then Michigan State backed off on them a little bit. 
They've gotten back in a little bit on a couple of those guys, talking about Kamari Landers out of Dearborn Fortson. And uh, <clears throat> Stokes, the running back from the Detroit area. Uh, you know, other guys that they've been in on, I mean, you look, you, you look at the offensive lineman Michigan State recruited this year. They've got their fourth commitment today. They got one from Colorado, one from Arizona, one from Georgia, one from Grand Haven, Michigan. And today, one from Colorado. If you look at Michigan, the state of Michigan top 30, the Rivals.com rankings, and those rankings are not scientific. They are a guess, like all recruiting rankings are. You look at the top 30, there's only three offensive linemen in the top 30. Now, there will be more offensive linemen that gain Division I scholarship offers and Power 5 offers. But as of now, those are the three. Number 20, Kamari Landers out of Deer, Dearborn Fordson. Number 23, Jackson Pruitt out of Detroit Cast Tech. Number 27, Ashton Lepo out of Grand Haven. Michigan State offered Landers and kind of backed off a little bit. Michigan State liked Lepo, went after him midwinter, or late winter, early spring, somewhere in there, got a commitment from him. That's it. Jackson Pruitt, they looked at him closely. They still are looking at him. He visited, did not offer. So they went and got three other offensive linemen out of state, Georgia, Arizona, Colorado. Would you prefer that they not recruit those guys out of state and instead lower their standards and go after some of these other players that didn't quite net scholarship offers? No, I think not. I don't think anyone, I don't think any Michigan State fan would want that. I think Michigan State fans would be happy that Michigan State identified early offensive linemen that they liked in Arizona, Georgia, Colorado, built a relationship with Chris Kapilovic, doing a great job as a a recruiter right now. I mean, recruits like him a lot. He's busy. He's high energy. Got him on camp for campus. Got Got him on campus for camp with Braden Miller this week. Loved it. They loved him. Committed. And they're still going after one more. Big guys, 6'6", 6, 6'7", 6, 6, 6, 300 plus, most of them. Lepo's 285 and growing. He's got a good frame to grow. Offensive line recruiting looks good. Prioritizing the state of Michigan. They'll go after the state of Michigan when they see fit. But they're prioritizing the nation. And I like the way they're doing it. I, I mean, I don't personally like it, but I, I, I don't dislike it. I'm just saying seems like a good pragmatic sensible way to go about things a little different than Michigan State's done it in the past and it's going to be interesting to see how it how it uh, produces teams in the future I would say it's that I'd say it's a good way to handle it um speaking of those recruits we'll go to question number two from muddy 32 out of Frankenmuth Michigan he says comp what is your take on the last two commitments Quavian Carter and Braden Miller you know Quavian Quavian Carter 6'4", 200 out of Lee County High School, Leesburg, Georgia. Strong program. Played in the state title game this year. Lost to Buford, Georgia. Another school that Michigan State's going to be recruiting hard. And Paul Konerdijk did a great story on Quavian Carter. Spoke to his coach, Dean Fabrizio, out of Leesburg, Georgia. And Fabrizio and those guys, they know Mel Tucker from when he was an assistant coach, defensive coordinator for the Georgia Bulldogs. And Michigan State with, what, two, three commitments from Georgia? You know, when Mel Tucker was hired, theoretically that was supposed to be a strong suit for him. His background recruiting in the SEC, coaching as an assistant coach most recently at Georgia, one year as a head coach at Colorado. But the ties he had in Georgia – when coaching for the Bulldogs or Alabama. In theory, that could help Michigan State. Head coach knows those coaches down there, knows the players, knows the neighborhoods, knows the people. That should help, right? That's all theory. Now you're seeing that theory put into practice, and they do know who he is. And Dean Fabrizio said in the article, Mel Tucker does a great job recruiting, does a good job with the, does a great job with evaluation. He knows that from his days at Georgia. That's a head coach of one of the best teams in the state of Georgia. So, Carter, you look at his film. I mean, long at six foot four, physical. He's listed at six four. He looks six four. He might be six three. I don't know, but he's tall, thick. He's like you know how Tony Lippett played physical at his height. I think Carter is similar, but a little thicker. Right now, definitely thicker now than Lippett was in high school. But Carter. Um, 
I tell you what, I mean, he, he, you, you watch his film, and some people don't aren't big on special teams film. I like special teams film. You can see the acceleration. You can see the want to. He's on kickoff coverage for one of the best teams in the state. First guy down there, laying out, full tilt, boom. Says a lot about him as a player that he does that. Heavy hitter. Straight line speed is good. You see that when he runs down the tailback from behind. And it's not just any tailback. It's a Georgia tailback. Runs him down from behind. Um, Playing safety. Field safety a lot. Covers ground. Rangy. Ball skills. Didn't really get a chance to see him turn his hips. Might be a little bit tight. I don't know in coverage. Might not be a guy you want to come up as a safety and play press coverage on a slot. Might not be his thing. But at 6'3 and a half, 6'4, 200, I'm guessing he might be a linebacker in the future. Linebackers, you know, he's 6'4, 200 comfortably right now. I'm guessing he could be like a 214 pounder with some pass coverage ability at the linebacker position. I think State recruited him as a safety. But would not surprise me if he becomes a box safety or a linebacker. And an interesting guy. As far as quotes in Conan Dyke's story, Coach Dean Fabrizio said, quote, he's a long kid with a lot of athleticism, and he's a really physical player. He says, I think that is the thing that sets him apart. There just aren't many kids with that much length that are as physical as he is and they can cover as much ground as he can, unquote. Coach Fabrizio would know better than I would. Good quotes there. And the thing is, he still has a visit scheduled for Ole Miss for June 25th. I'm assuming he's not going to take that, but we will look into that. Hey, it's Southeastern recruiting. This one might not be over. Some people like to say recruiting doesn't start till someone makes a commitment. If you're a Michigan State fan, fan, you hope that that's not the case. But, you know, the day he committed to Michigan State, Clemson offered. Clemson. Florida State's offered. Ole Miss is offered. He's a three-star guy, but he's commanding a four-star type of recruitment. And maybe it is just getting starter, started. But the good news is Michigan State got in on this guy, 6'3", 200, rare type of specimen. He liked Michigan State, visited. That was it. For now. Don't mean to scare anybody, but just being real. You go down there, you get a good player to commit like that. You probably want other schools to come after him. Am I wrong? You don't want to go down there and get a commitment from somebody that nobody else wants. Braden Miller. Braden Miller. All right, there he is right there. Braden Miller. What is he, about 6'7", 300? I can look that one up. He will be one of these days if he's not already. Should know that off the top of my head, but. He's from Colorado. Uh, Centennial Colorado Eagle Crest High School listed at 67290 by Rivals.com, ranked the number five player in the state of Colorado. And uh, he checks a lot of boxes at offensive tackle. And I I made this post over at, at the Underground Bunker message board earlier today. And I, hey, he's got some thickness. Square body guy that can really move. I was trying to get some video together to post. Didn't get it together in time. I was hoping that he would repost his video somewhere else so that it would be more public domain. Um, but I think he's excellent. Excellent. Excellent with his lateral movement and pass protection. You see him. He's nimble. He's nimble the way when, when he... Uh, Zone blocking, cross his face, or when he pulls on the counter plays, pulls, turns the corner, gets downhill. Good feet for a big dude. Nimble, and then punishes you when he gets to you. He's a nimble punisher. A nimble punisher. It's a good combination. And the, the power shows up. When he goes against people, you know, he plays some defensive line in high school too. And the way he engages and can steering wheel some people, shoulder club. I, I posted that. On the shoulder club, he's like Grizzly Bear versus Park Ranger. Or I might have said like Bear versus Backpacker with the shoulder club. Uh, you know, Braden Miller, I think he's excellent. And Michigan State, as everybody knows, has been kind of hit and miss with offensive line recruiting in recent years. You know, Jordan Reed came in, did an okay job. But, you know, he wasn't like square body strong like you need. Now, our Curry has grown into that. 
and when you recruited our Curry, you thought he could get to that. This guy Miller is is further along in that evolution. He's there. Um, you know, way beyond guys like Noah Listerman. Listerman came in as a project who had some athleticism, but did not have that square body strength and never got on the field. Nothing against him, but we can all think of recruitments at Michigan State at tackle that have gone awry. Dennis Finley had some ability, but lacked some of that tenacity that you need. Had some injuries, um, catastrophic injuries, did his best, never quite came around. This guy, you know, and also at, at offensive tackle sometimes – or all up and down the offensive line. In recent years, um, maybe it's been like this forever, but it, it, there have been a lot of injuries on the offensive line. It's almost as if you need to recruit 15 offensive linemen to get seven good ones or six good ones because some of the good ones are just going to have shoulders and ribs and clavicles. Maybe not clavicles. They have things that just give out. You know, I mean, Zach Huter was good. Athletic, underrated. Had everything, but just just the skeleton the skeleton didn't hang together long enough. I saw him at Fair State a couple weeks ago too. By the way, he's coaching. Um, David Barrett was a four star guy from Iowa many years ago, maybe twelve years ago. Had a lot of ability, injuries. And that was it. Skyler Schaffner, you remember him, right? Big timer, injuries, never quite got going. You know, some guys get going and 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 get their careers interrupted like Mike Getvey. So just because I'm saying these great things about Braden Miller does not guarantee he's going to be like a three-year starter and a standout player. Those A lot of those guys I just mentioned could have, would have been very good players, but sometimes shoulders and things just give out. But he's coming in healthy, and he's what you want. You want tackles like him. Lateral movement and pass protection, pull, turn a corner with that agility, get downhill, get low, dominate somebody you can tell he's been well coached there's this one um you know a couple of, of highlights where he's taking on a linebacker defensive end stunt and he just stays low and just filters it out while he's backpedaling into his pass set and whether it's film study or what he's just on it it looks like a veteran it looks like a college player doing those things one time he's at pass protection corner blitz sees it picks it up moves doesn't like come up come apart come out of his shoes and reach for him technically sound I like Braden Miller I I think he's a four-star type of guy you guys know that I liked Ryan Bear a lot Ryan Bear top 20 kid in Ohio I said a lot of great things about him when Michigan State was recruiting him going back to early spring and then last week he was given four-star status by rivals.com and I think deservedly so I still like Ryan Bear a lot Braden Miller is a lot like Ryan Bear. They are same type of animal, good players. Michigan State still has some scholarship room. They still like Ryan Bear. They still like Alessandro Lorenzetti out of prep school in Connecticut, originally from Montreal. They like him still. And they're going after some other guys that are committed elsewhere, like Goodwin Chambly at, at Arkansas and Good, Goodwin Louisville commitment, commitment Goodwin. Those might be long shots. Probably are. But State's got four good offensive line commitments. I thought they might try to add a center this year. Looks like they might be backing off on that a little bit. Some of the others can move inside if necessary. But, hey, both of those guys, excellent prospects. You know, in terms of straight line speed, reminds me a little bit of an underrated offensive lineman that I really liked coming out of the Down River area around 2012, 2013. And that was Cody Keeler. Now, Keeler had good straight line speed, very underrated, pretty good lateral movement, and he built himself up into having some good upper body strength and strong enough to play in the Big Ten. I think Miller has some of that athleticism, but he comes, but he's stronger at this point. And Keeler, I was going off Keeler's high school senior film. This is Miller's junior film, so there's more good films to, to come from him. Now, Keeler, some of you may remember, struggled against Alabama in the in the college football playoff. I've got news for you. Everybody struggled against Alabama that year, 2015. Nobody could pass protect against those guys. So Keeler was a good two-and-a-half-year starter, right tackle, not an NFL guy. I'm just talking in terms of frame. You know, Keeler was a little more narrow, 
but Keeler had some good straight line athleticism, which, which, you know, lended itself to more growth in other areas. And he was a quality, quality college football player. I like this guy Miller right here. That guy right there, Miller. I like him. Good pickup for Michigan State. That's good. I'm going to pause right now to throw a tweet, a tweet out there. Let's see if I can find it. And I think we saw... I think I saw some personal sponsorships. Let me see if I can find them. Hey, guys, if you do a personal sponsorship, feel th- feel free to post a question with it, and I will go to your question first. And Brad Fashenko and Don Strait. Appreciate the support from those guys. Appreciate it. Meantime, we ask everybody to subscribe to this channel. Give us a thumbs up. That helps with our numbers. If I could find the, the DJ horn, I would honk it, but I can't find the DJ horn. So sorry, Don. Sorry, Brad. And Don, thanks for sponsorship on a regular basis. Really appreciate that. I don't have the horn here. My bad. I'll put that up there, though. You see it? You got the phone number there. If everything works, we're going to try to take phone calls. We're going to try to do it. Open mic night on a Wednesday night, East Lansing, Michigan. It's almost summertime. Feels like summer. I'm just talking about like first day of summer, summer. And I'll tell you what, those of you in the northwest corner of the state, northern lower Michigan, north of here, west of here, Man, it's it stays day. It's probably still daylight up there. It's nine twenty six right now as we record this. It stays daylight forever up there. You guys are probably still on the golf course. Love it. All right, let me see if I can send this tweet out. But hey, Brad Fashenko, Don Strait, appreciate you guys a lot. Appreciate all the maggers, everybody tuning in. Support we get. Let me see. Let me uh, go ahead and find this. Might have some feedback here. North of here, west there of here. Is. There it is. There's the feedback. Man. Here's a tweet. Appreciate your patience. Throw this one on Facebook too. See if this one works. All right. We got it now. So feel free to post over here in the comments section. We will get to those questions as well. See what we got here. Call from... Nick Harrington. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. All right, let's go out to Battle Creek, Michigan with Nick Harrington. Nick, how are you doing, man? Pretty good, Tom. How's it going? Really good. Appreciate you giving me your last name. I, I, you don't have to give a last name on this, but I appreciate you trying to be straight oh, with everything. You. Hey, it's okay with me. I just, just want to remind everybody you don't have to, but we don't. that's how we screen yeah, calls for there sure, a little for bit. Sure. What's going on, Nick? Oh, not much. You know, I've been kind of caught up with all this, uh, you know, stuff coming out of Ann Arbor with Bo Schembechler and the uh, allegations, rather, and mm-hmm. everything. And I just wonder, you know, if you when you look at the way this impacted Michigan State and Ohio State and Penn State, even though it's at the early stages of this, do you think this is going to impact an already deteriorating situation over there, like especially for recruiting? And then also another quick, like, side question mm-hmm. – any any chance we're going to see anything from the hockey team this year, like mm. uh, at all? <laughs> mm. And that's that, that, that's it. <laughs> all right, Nick. Appreciate it. Uh, hang on for a second. Yeah, the Schembechler situation yeah. in, in in Ann Arbor. The I mean, the doctor, whatever his name was, tragic situation. Feel bad for the eight hundred plus people that were victims and victimized by it. Uh, Schembechler, not a obviously. I mean, you guys know what that is. It's it's terrible. And the, the things that his stepson said, um, unbelievable. Nick, I'm going to go to the next call, and I'll call answer, from answer that question. You. Nick Bagaris. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press Hey, Nick. Jim Comperoni, SpartanMag.com. Turn your radio down, please, and we'll get to your question in a minute. Appreciate it, okay? You there? Yeah, you got it. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, as far as... You know, I was asked a question a moment ago about the situation in Michigan and how what impact it's having on recruiting. I don't think it's having an impact on recruiting. All those things that happened were 
four coaches ago or however many coaches ago, decades ago. It's, you know, it, it takes some shine away. You know, I mean, when they have their visits, you know, they, they, they roll out a lot of red carpet and they've got a lot of things they can honk, a lot of things they can, a lot of flags they can wave. Does that reduce the Schembechler stuff a little bit? I don't know what kind of films they see when they're there. I don't know what kind of, you know, some of the old, uh, you know, like, is like uh, you know, Shem Beckler, the film of him, you know, talking about the team, the team, the team. Can they still use that? that I mean, that was, that was a big rallying call for them in recent years, as it should have been. I mean, that, that's an iconic moment, iconic phrase. But now can they still use that? I mean, they'll be, they'll be able to recruit with other things, of course. But it takes a little bit of shine off of things. But it's not going to hurt recruiting because the people that are there now had nothing to do with it. But, um, yeah, it has an impact. On, it'll have an impact on other things. The checkbook, of course. But recruiting, maybe a little bit. It just takes a little bit of the shine and momentum out of, out of that program. And that's a program in dire need of some momentum. And the timing is not good for that. The elephant in the room... Can I say it? Harbaugh, he was a player during that time. I mean, you have to wonder. You have to wonder about that. Uh, the question earlier about Michigan State hockey, you know, I thought they'd be better last year, last season. So I'm assuming they'll be better. They've moved a couple people on, went into the portal. That should help. I, off the top of my head, I, you know, I, I can't think of um, – it's been a while since I've thought about them. But, you know, it's hard to get in the NCAA tournament out of the Big Ten. They'll take two – sometimes three and that schedule is tough and I don't know if they'll be any closer this year. I don't know, but they thought they'd be better this year and I thought they would be also. That's a tough one to read, but let's go to Nick. Nick, now this Nick, where are you from, Nick? Where are you calling from? Yeah, I'm calling from uh, Novi, Michigan. Novi, Michigan. Nick, what's on your mind tonight? Yeah, you know, Jim, just have a uh, a quick question. My, uh, Me and my family love your, your player evaluation, so I, I was just curious. Uh, of all the uh, of all the quarterback prospects that they have, they're looking at right now. I'm sure you've looked at their film. I was just curious which one you like the most, um, and why. Man, I really appreciate that question. And I've looked at them, and I've I've not like I, I hate to disappoint you, but I've not like really super super studied everybody. Um, you know, I looked at AJ okay. Duffy. I looked at you know Markiall. Uh, Markiall's a left hander with some. Mobility, got some toughness. When he committed to Florida State, some people, the people at Florida State compared him to Tim Tebow a little bit. I don't know if he's that strong. But Mark Yall, I mean, you know, makes some things happen. Justin Martin out of Inglewood, California. You know, he, Michigan State was in contact with him. And Jason Killip reported that, you know, Michigan State's not been talking to him as much lately. That comes from Justin Martin. So Justin knows Michigan State's board. He can see that Nico Marchial and Caton Hauser, the commitment to Boise State, those are the two high guys on the Michigan State board. You know, Michigan State's been in contact with Jaden Denegal out of Apple Valley, California. I've looked at those guys, and I've looked at highlights, but to look at quarterbacks, I like to look at a full game. I want to see their incompletions. I want to see their interceptions, you know? And I've not done that with, with, with these guys. So you can see some ability. But I've not gone top to bottom on, on those guys yet. I appreciate the question, but I've not gotten that part of my work done, Nick. I'm sorry. And I'm no, not, that's all right. I appreciate I, it. I've not looked at, at Luther Richardson at all yet. He's the guy from Lipskin, uh, Lipskin Academy in Tennessee. He's done some good things in some camps this summer. Michigan State offered, and then they've kind of kept him on the back burner a little bit. Again, I've seen highlights. Um, you know, and these days you're seeing a lot of guys – yeah, it's it's like everybody has mobility. Everybody can, you know, can execute the RPOs and throw on the run. Can you hit the the 17-yard out from the left hash to the right sideline outside the numbers? You know, sometimes you know, one guy that could do that and did have the arm strength to do it was Theo Day, but he never showed it on his high school film because he was never asked to do it. So I was wondering about Theo Day's arm strength when he came to Michigan State. He came to Michigan State, and he had plenty of arm strength. It was the other things that were lacking. So, it, you know, film can be funny with that a little bit. But to answer your question, I'd like to see full games. I'd like to see incompletions, interceptions, those type of things. Great question, though. Anything else, Nick? No, that's it. I appreciate it, Jim. Thank hey, you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate you. 
Well, I failed that question. I failed there. It won't be the last time. Will not be the last time. Let's go over here to... What? Let's see. Jason Killup is uh, sounding in here. All right. Jason Killup doing a great job with us. SpartanMag.com helping with recruiting coverage. Doing a great job with that. Noah Sprunger doing a great job. Intern extraordinaire and then some. And Kenny Jordan also and Paul Konadyke. Great job as usual. Getting a lot of comments from people wanting to get us back into uh, skull session mode, podcast mode. We've been working, you know, we, we've got some content on the message board. The podcasts, I've been a little bit behind on those because it was a busy spring for personal reasons, good reasons, but it was busy. I appreciate the continued support from the maggers out there. Let's go over here to the comments area. Old Tuck checked in first. It's good to have Old Tuck back in the starting lineup. Matthew Johnson in the starting lineup today. Noah, that's Noah Sprunger. Intern extraordinaire for SpartanMag.com. He's one of the three. We've got Terrence from Oklahoma City. Check out Terrence. And we got Ron Warner. Go green from the Oop. So we got uh, Old Tuck in the middle. Old Tuck's claiming that he front runs to the front rim like Peplowski. I don't doubt it with Old Tuck. He's the big toe of the organization. No, no, no. He's the bell cow. He's the bell cow. Rob South is the big toe, right? We got Tuck in the middle. We got Noah running the point today. Matthew Johnson on one wing. Got Terrence on the other wing. We got Ron Warner. An old school Ron Warner from the UP. He's an old school power forward. He's no stretch four. He's not a stretch four. He's a power forward. Old school. Like Truck Robinson. Anybody remember Truck Robinson? Leonard Truck Robinson? From the New Orleans Jazz. Not the Utah Jazz. New Orleans Jazz. Look him up. All-star power forward. Averaged like seven points a game. But he was an all-star. Circa 1978. All right, Jacob Terry's here. He's ready to go. Old Tuck says, we need a Bill Johnson or a Bobby Williams to emerge this year. Maybe it's Mr. Mallory. I know uh, my guy Nils Deco loved that offensive line with Johnson and Wilson and those guys. Mallory, he's got some ability. Could use a little more nastiness out of him. Defensive tackle is going to be solid. Defensive tackle is going to be solid. DN's going to be good against the run. Could use some edge threat pressure, you know. Could help that to pass, help the pass defense. Rob South, he's the big toe. The big toe is more tardy than Ken Tinney is in his first week on campus. Oh, I see. Old Tuck is calling out Rob Tinney, and, he, and, he's, and he's crafting a Ken Tinney reference for comedic effect. We appreciate the comedic effect. Ken Tinney, very talented defensive back recruit from the John L. Smith era. He lasted roughly four weeks. Not sure he found his way to ATL or Natsai. You know what I'm talking about. Angelo Gross, Harold Joyner enthusiast, he's here. And he says, how do things look with the Marquial and others like Hauser and Richardson? Talked about quarterback recruiting a little bit. That's a big topic. Hey, and Marquial visited Michigan State two weeks ago. Loved it. Visited West Virginia last weekend. Loved it more. Loved it more. Country Roads. He said it was the time of his life. I don't think I've ever heard that before. From a recruit after a visit. I don't think I've ever heard that before. And. Let me move that thing. And. I doubt you're going to get a recruit who says he had time of his life elsewhere. There were some photos coming out of that visit to West Virginia. It looked like there was water involved, like a boat or something. I don't know what was going on. Who knows? Brad Paisley might have been there. It looked like a Brad Paisley video. You guys know who Brad Paisley is? He's a West Virginia fan. Wrote a song called Water a few years ago. That was a pretty good song. 
I'm not like Mr. Country Music fan. I like all music. But there are some good songwriters in that genre. If I can go off topic a little bit. But, Mark y'all, it's looking like West Virginia to me from my seat. These co- these quarterback recruits this year, I don't know if they're in collaboration, but they don't do many interviews. They will do interviews at Elite of 11 events or camps, but in terms of catching them on the phone or direct messages or texts, A.J. Duffy didn't do much. Mark y'all, not much. Kate and Hauser, not much. Now, Mark y'all and Hauser, you know, those guys... When you're committed somewhere, you're less likely to do interviews if you're opening it back up because you just don't you just keep it low, which I can I can appreciate. So, so Hauser was supposed to visit in two weeks, and instead he's visiting this weekend. So Michigan State expediting the situation, wanted to bring him in, whether that would put a little heat on Markiel or it would help them move on in case they didn't get Markiel. I don't know what it is, but it, it, I think that's good for Michigan State to get him in now. He's committed to Boise State. Why is he looking around? I don't know. Boise State's a great place. Boise, sorry. Boise, Boise State. Boise State. Boise. Boise. I got to get that one straight. Boise State. Boise's beautiful. I'm looking forward to going there in a couple years when Michigan State plays there. Looks beautiful on TV. I can't claim I've been there. So actually, I don't know, but everybody says it's great. And they've done a lot of winning, and they're pretty good. Michigan State's been up and down, but we all know that Michigan State's a different level in terms of bells and whistles and support and the whole shot. So he's going to come in and check it out. Somebody posted on the Underground Bunker message board today, who do I or who does Noah think is going to be Michigan State's quarterback in this class? I would say if I had to choose one name, the most likely one I think might be Hauser because I think Markiel is slipping away. Noah made the point that that ship is not sailed. It's not over. He might have some information that I don't have, but I'm thinking it's country roads on that one. So Hauser's next one at the plate. I think that uh, I'm not predicting he's going to decommit and end up at Michigan State. And the way I, the way I phrased it, I said – you know, from a confidence meter standpoint, I might put it at 40% chance he ends up at Michigan State, but he's the name most likely. The most likely is probably the field. You know, everybody on earth except Hauser, which would include Markiel. But if I had to choose one name, he would be at 40%, and everybody else by name would be less than that. So it's interesting, but I don't have a read on that one. And like Jacob J- Jacob Terry posted, Markiel set his commitment for the 21st next Monday. So he's seen enough. He's he's ready to make a decision. And once again, I'm thinking country roads. Slant the bar. To accept, press one. To send a voicemail, press. All right, let's go to Upland, California. Debar, I only got your last name, man. What's your What's your first name? Welcome to SpartanMag.com. Spartan Mag Live. Well, my name is Lance. I'm Lance. actually I'm actually from from Mesa, Arizona. So. All right, all right, Lance from Mesa, Arizona. I just threw Upland, California out there. Well, that's what that's what your caller ID says. No, you're good. You're good, Jim. Good. Stay, oh, it, Upland, it, California. Jim, wanted... Did you did, did you used to live in Upland, <laughs> California, a little bit? I actually did. I grew up grew up in California. Went to the Rose Bowl twenty thirteen. Yeah. So Upland, California used to be a Winston Cup driver by the name of Joe Rutman from Upland, California. You wouldn't know that. <laughs> Upland. He, no, I, the reason, no. I mean, this is obscure. There might be one person listening that might ring a bell because Joe Rutman was a was a really good short track driver at Mount Clemens Racetrack back in the eighties. Went NASCAR a little bit out of <laughs> Upland, California. I'm kind of embarrassed that yeah, I know I'm, that. I'm 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 ashamed of myself for knowing that. Go ahead. <laughs> you're What's... good. You're good, Jim. You're you're a jack of all trades. But I just want to thank you for a uh, long time uh, magger since 2005. Really appreciate your you and your team's work. Got a couple questions for you here. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> uh, one, uh, two actually bas- uh, one basketball question and a football question. Um. I know Carter came in for that official visit on June 4th. Um, <clears throat> want to see where we stand with him, uh, the tight ends, uh, the kid out of Chandler, the one out of Georgia, and then for basketball, I want to see where we're, we're, what we're looking with Hall, uh, Hallam and the point guard out of St. Paul. 
Hollum. And, you know, I talked to him a couple of days ago. I got a story brewing on him. And he liked All his right. visit, loved it. I didn't get the sense that, uh, you know, that he's about to commit anytime soon. He, he's still planning to go uh, to Marquette at the end of the month. And there was a question coming up on the um, in the mailbag area where I was going to talk about that a little bit. And uh, let's see, you know, Minnesota's in there, Michigan's in there, and Oklahoma State is starting to get, to get in with him a little bit. So I, I think he really liked it. He liked everything about it. Um, let's see. He, he, he thought he, he, he thinks Izzo's hilarious. He got a kick out of that. Who was his host? Who was his, it was, it was, uh, um, who did he tell me his host was? Gabe Brown. Gabe Brown was his host and Gabe Brown <laughs> showed him a good time. He thought he was great. Oh. And, uh, you know, I would have thought that maybe coming out of that, 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 uh, that he might have been, you know, t- you know, thinking commitment a little more seriously, but I think he's just kind of waiting his time a little bit. Minnesota's in there, you know, trying to get in there, but I think State's got a solid shot at him. He's a two, he's a six foot two, strong. He's got some strength. He's a creative point guard, a pure passing point guard who's improving his shot making ability and scoring ability. He's a tough quarterback type of guy. Tough quarterback. Mm-hmm. You also asked about Chase. Izzo's had a lot of success with those guys. Exactly. The years. And, and and Trey Holloman also, for people that don't know, is an excellent football player, safety. And Michigan State offered him in football. Nebraska is recruiting him hard as a defensive back, football first. So Trey Holloman has to decide which sport he wants to major in in college. Now, you can play football and dabble in basketball, but you can't play basketball and dabble in football. It doesn't work that way, you know? No. So... Mm-hmm. He's got to decide which sport. I'm guessing he's going to decide basketball. You know, if I were him, I would decide basketball. I mean, he might be really good at football. When people make those decisions, you know, they, you know, people around him, they might say, hey, man, you know, you're a good basketball player, but it's really hard to make the NBA, which is true. It, it, you might have an easier time making the NFL, which might be true. However, the NFL stands for not for long, Right. You're not in that league very long. Yeah. And, hey, football's hazardous. Let's face it. It's hazardous to your health, you know. If you can play basketball, mm-hmm. you might not make the NBA, but there's money to be made in Europe. That's the part of the equation that recruits high schoolers that are deciding between sports. So they don't take the European option. There's a That European safety net is there for players, you know, that, that don't make the NBA. Charlie Bell made a million bucks in the Premier League in Europe. Um, Matt Trannon went football, had a good college football career, but, you know, he kind of de-emphasized basketball after 10th grade. And yes, at his height, he might not have been an NBA player, didn't quite have the skill for his height. His, he, had, he had some height. He was an interior player, but but he could have played in Europe. You know, heck, he might still be playing in Europe if he mm-hmm. played basketball. But I uh, hear, Actually, funny story about Matt, about Matt Trannon, I he lives, he, he he lives in Arizona. Worked, he, he lives in Arizona, right? Yeah, he, he actually sold he sold my family a car. Actually, did he? <laughs> did, yeah. Did he? Did yeah. he seem? Did he, he seem? Got a picture with him and every <laughs> super cool guy. He is good, right? He, he seems happy and content. He's doing fine, right? Uh huh. He's doing good. That's good. All right, Lance. Anything else? No, we're good. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Lance. There he goes, Lance Mesa, Arizona. Uh, he, he asked about Chase Carter a little bit, also. You know, Chase Carter. Defensive end from Minneapolis, Minnehaha Academy, visited Michigan State recently. Loved it. Longtime friends with Terry Lockett since fifth grade. Terry Lockett, wide receiver at Michigan State. Now, that's another guy that's a basketball player. Chase Carter had basketball offers early from Florida, West Virginia, Minnesota, Vanderbilt. Uh, You know, this year, he played with Chet Holmgren, as a matter of fact. High school and grassroots with Chet Holmgren number one player for basketball for 2023 or 2022. And Carter's a good basketball player this year, averaged about seven, kind of a role player. So I'm not sure he's still a power five basketball type of guy. And I think he knows that talking to him a little bit, you know, Michigan state told him and he met with Izzo while he was on campus. And they said, if that's something you want to pursue, we can open that door for you and you can give it a try. 
you'll have a shot at it while you're here. Um, but I think he's, I think he's stepping away from Chase Carter, stepping away from his hoop dreams a little bit. But all right, when I talked to Chase Carter, like the week he was coming to visit Michigan State, he said Michigan State, Iowa, Iowa State were the three that he was the most serious about. They were the ones that were, they were the most serious about him. And he was excited about those three, wanted to visit those three, and then make a decision after those visits, probably in early July. He visited Iowa State last weekend, I think, and Michigan State the week before. This weekend, no visits, I don't think, unless something just springs up this week. And then Iowa, June 25th, and that was supposed to be all. Then the Cornhuskers came calling, the deadweight Huskers. They came after him. And lo and behold, he schedules an official visit September 3rd, Lincoln, Nebraska. So he's going to wait till his visits. So that means till after September. So that threw a wrench in things. Right. It sounded to me like he was planning to decide July. Michigan State was right there. And I asked him about it. And he said, yeah, Nebraska, you know, they, they showed a lot of love late this week. And that changed things around a little bit. So... That one, I, uh, you know, if I'd been doing a confidence meter, I would have had Michigan State with as the favorite for a decision before July 10th. Now that thing is open again. Chase Carter, defensive end from Minnesota. All right, let's go back here to the mailbag. Where are we at? Lost my place. Dead air. Can't find the mailbag. Here it is. All right. From Mile High in Golden, Colorado, he says, thanks for all you do, comp. I hope you and your family are well. By the way, it's getting to be, with a late start time tonight, it's going to be kind of late. I'm going to try to go quickly through these, wrap this thing up. I don't want to keep you guys here past midnight because I'll, I'll do it if you're not careful. He says, thanks for all you do. Hope you and your family are well. Thank you, Golden Colorado Mile High Man. He says, what's the latest in basketball recruiting? Where does Michigan State stand with? Terrace Reed. He says, Reed, Trout. Holloway, Wright, Shut, etc. Well, you know, Isaac Trout, power forward from Nebraska, ranked number 67 player in the country, 6'9", 200, stretch four, good shooter, could become a great shooter. Officially visited Nebraska June 4th, Virginia last weekend, Michigan State this weekend, and I think North Carolina the weekend after that. Top 100 kid. Michigan State's right in there. Got a shot. He loved that Virginia visit, though. So Michigan State's got the work cut out for them. Terrace Reed, number 77 player in the country, 6'8 center from St. Louis, Chaminade. I'm hearing he's going to be changing high schools. So he's been very hard to get a hold of. He visited Purdue, visited Michigan State. Um, has not done any, any interviews since making those visits. The last time I checked, I checked about three or four days ago. As far as I could tell, no interviews. So Terrence Reed locking it down. I hear it went well. I asked Trey Holloman about him a little bit. Said it was good. Trey Holloman, they played some open gym a little bit. Holloman fed him with some passes a little bit. Terrace Reed's out there. Kijani Wright, 6'8", 220, Los Angeles. Windward, number 10 player in the country. Big timer. Talked about him a few weeks ago. Um, I mentioned the Michigan State that Kijani Wright out of Los Angeles, he essentially recruited Michigan State, not the other way around. Michigan State does not do a lot of recruiting in California or the West Coast. This guy wanted to be recruited by Michigan State. And... He's got some cooks in the kitchen. Some of them like USC. Some like Michigan State. I'd wait and see. I kind of think it might be hard to get him off the West Coast. I would lean toward USC on that one. And it's basketball recruiting. Could take some twists and turns. Trey Holloway, Marquette later this month. Like I said, he's the point guard for Minneapolis. Jaden Shutt is a six foot five hundred eighty pound wing guard from Yorkville, Illinois. I saw him play about a month ago down at the run and slam in Fort Wayne. 
reasonably good athleticism, very good shooter, qu- quick release, good off the bounce, kind of a Matt McQuaid type of guy. McQuaid might be a, a little more athletic, shut in high school, a little better shooter. I know McQuaid became a very good 40% shooter as a senior, but McQuaid as a high schooler, not as good of a shooter as a junior as shut is right now, in my opinion. McQuaid had some strength about him, though, some wiry strength. And McQuaid was mentally tough, too. McQuaid was a killer. Shutt's kind of in that category. A little bit. Michigan State's there. I think it's Michigan State and the Illini. And Shutt is visiting Michigan State this weekend. Very good chance I'll, I'll get a chance to talk to him after the visit. Unlike Mr. Reed. Question number four, Nolan from Grand Rapids. Jim... What unit on the roster, football roster, are you the most worried about for the 2021 season? And overall, do you expect to see more improvements on on offense or defense in 2021? Uh, the improvement has to come on offense, right? I mean, Michigan State last year in the Big Ten, number 14 in the Big Ten in total offense, number 13 in yards per play. The quarterback problems had a lot to do with that. The fact that Michigan State theoretically played Maybe, I mean, on paper, it was the hardest schedule in the Big Ten in some ways because their crossovers were Northwestern, who was the West champion, right? And I don't know who the other one was. Indiana was good. Everybody knows that. Penn State had a bad record, but they're pretty good, right? Michigan was terrible, but they were top 13 when Michigan State played them, and then you got Ohio State. So... But that can't be the whole reason for it, right? I mean, the offense, quarterback. So offense got look has to look completely different. Offensive line needs to grow up. So what am I most worried about in terms of Michigan State's, for Michigan State's concerns, for Michigan State's, from their point of view, I would be most worried about offensive line, defensive backfield. Offensive line, a lot of players re- are returning, but that group has kind of always had trouble playing good football. I think Kapilovic is very good, and in time, they're going to have a good offensive line. Can that, will that happen this year with these holdover players? I think it's possible, but I kind of thought they'd be better last year. However, they had no offseason strength program, and that was the same way all around the country, right? But I'll be eager to see this Michigan State offensive line. Veteran group, you bring in Jarrett Horst as a grad, as a portal transfer a lot of guys on there with a lot of experience. Now they've had a full year with Novak, the strength coach, and the strength coach is dynamic. Dietitians, all those things. I got to believe they will be the best physical versions of themselves when they get back on the field in the fall. I don't think they'll be bad. I do not think they'll be bad. Will they be good? Maybe. Will they be quite good? It's possible. Will they be very good? I doubt it. I mean, we're not talking pixie dust here. That's my scale. You'd be functional, good, quite good. I think quite good is better than good. You with me? Functional, good, quite good, very good. And then championship level or, and then great. I'm making some of this up as I go along. You guys know that. But anyway, um, offensive line and defensive backfield. Defensive backfield, big question mark. Some talent there, but I, dude, I've not seen these guys play. You, you haven't seen them play. We don't know. I mean, you have Xavier Henderson back at safety. He should be fine. Angelo Gross, true sophomore, moving back to safety. Saw him in the spring game. He should be fine. I thought he did pretty well. Physical guy for a corner. Maybe you could stand him to be just a touch quicker with his hips. That's why he goes back to safety. But he's physical enough to play back at safety. Is he big enough to come in and be a box safety on a given play? I assume so. Otherwise, they wouldn't have him back there. But I think Henderson and Gross should be okay. But at corner, dude, I don't know. They're playing Yahtzee back there. It's like they took a bunch of defensive backs. They they got got rid of all the defensive backs, put some more in, shook up the dice, and they're just going to roll it, and I'm not sure what it's going to look like. You have Kalen Gervin coming back. He's been kind of a mixed bag. You guys know that. You're bringing in Ronald Williams, a specimen from Alabama. Veteran, mature guy. Went to Alabama out of junior college. Big guy, 6'2". Looks like a million bucks. Chester Kimbrough coming in was a second stringer at Florida. Kari Crump didn't play at Arizona. 
Marquis Lowry, I don't think, played at Louisville, but they're in there. Charles Brantley coming in as a true freshman from Florida. By the middle of the year, would not surprise me if he rises up like a Cedric Henry type of guy and can get on the field. So, out of that Yahtzee can, I don't know how it's going to roll out. No idea. they got to learn all the stuff. They've got great coaching. Tillman, Barnett, Tucker, they got great coaching. But they're, you know, Ronald Williams is just now showing up. Kimbrough just now showing up. Crump just now showing up. Lowry just now showing up. Brantley just now showing up. They were not here in the spring. So they got a long way to go and a short time to get there, to quote Jerry Reed. That's my second country music reference of the night, and I promise you that's the last one. Anyway, I don't know what it's going to look like, but they've improved their size and talent there at the corner position. On the discard, you know, the Dominic Long, transfer portal. Christian Jackson, transfer portal, Washington State. Those guys were somewhat functional, but I think Tucker wanted bigger, stronger, tougher people. It's hard to get that. To, it's hard to know for sure what you're getting out of the portal. That's why I call it Yahtzee. Question number five, B flows Spartan from parts unknown. He says, comp, Thanks for doing these Spartan Mag Lives. Thank you. He says, with ongoing scandals at schools we compete with for recruits like Michigan and Arizona State, do you see these current staff, do you see the current Michigan State staff doing much negative recruiting? Did D'Antonio's staff do any negative recruiting? No, D'Antonio's staff didn't do, that's just not D'Antonio's style. The most negative D'Antonio would get on recruiting would, would be, would, he would tell people to seek the truth, find the truth. He would talk about that with people that were considering Michigan and Michigan State. And in his opinion, people that went to Michigan would major in staying eligible or being corralled into eligibility. He wouldn't come out and say it. He would challenge the players and their parents to seek the truth. That's about as hardcore as he'd get on that. Mel Tucker, a little less of a filter. Negative recruit. About the current scandal, probably not. He might say something like, you know, they got their own problems down there, you know, whatever, whatever. He might just, he might be a little passive on that. If he's going to negative recruit, he will do it from his own strength. For instance, if he's talking about defensive backfield coaching, he will talk about how great Tillman is. With He played in the NFL. Tillman coached in the NFL. Barnett played in the NFL. He's produced 15 NFL players. Mel Tucker, Coached in the NFL, all our defensive backfield centric, defensive backfield minds. If you're a defensive back, why would you not want to play at Michigan State? That's what Tucker's going to say. And Tucker's a pretty good salesperson. And he will rip a couple salesperson pages out of the Nick Saban book and put it in front of you to where, to make you feel like an idiot if you say no to him. And that pitch, pretty effective. Doesn't mean they're going to get all the defensive backs in the world. And he might compare it to other schools and their defensive backs, coaches, and their experience. That's passively negative. Stuff like that. But I don't see him hammering home the Schembechler thing right now. But, hey, he's going to... If he has a chance to negative recruit, he'll do it. I think. I've not heard him do it. I just, I just think he will. Sherlock H. from Sterling Heights says... How do you think the new 12-team playoff format will work? How will if, how will it affect the bowl games? Will the first four teams eliminated be eligible for bowl games, or will the playoff games be considered bowl games? No, if you, if you get beaten in one of the first four games, you're not going to go to a bowl game. Um, I think what you'll see is with a 12-team format, first of all, fewer players are going to be opting out of the postseason. For instance, last year was at Florida that lost a ton of players before the bowl game. Uh, I think Florida might have been a top 12 type of team. They would have been in the playoff. Those players wouldn't have quit. And I know they quit. They opted out. I don't blame them. Uh, And Florida went out and lost their bowl game to who? Oklahoma, I think. So apparently Oklahoma, they didn't have as many players opt out. So apparently it means more at Oklahoma. Because in the Big 12, it just means more. 
you see, because Oklahoma's players didn't opt out. The Florida players from the SEC, they opted out, so it must not mean as much. It means less to them. Uh, so what's going to happen to the bowl games? The bowl games will become more and more like the NIT, unfortunately, or fortunately. I mean, you know, we, we remember those lean years at Michigan State. Well, we're currently in lean years right now. But, for instance, you know, Michigan State played some big bowl games against Alabama and Georgia and the Outback Bowl, Citrus Bowl, early in the D'Antonio era. Had a little bit of a step back, and in 2012, they were in danger of not making a bowl game. Went to Minnesota for a night game, played it in like 10 degree single digit temperatures, beat Minnesota. Le'Veon Bell had a big game. That win elevated Michigan State, I think, to six and six, made them bowl eligible. And that seemed like an accomplishment at the time, did it not? Be honest with yourselves. If you're a Michigan State fan, the night Michigan State beat Minnesota became bowl eligible, that meant something, did it not? Went to what? What was it? The, what bowl was it out in, in? It was the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl in Arizona. Played TCU. TCU was having a shaky season, but TCU had been a strong program for a number of years. Had beaten Wisconsin in the Rose Bowl, I think the previous year. Michigan State goes out there, falls behind by 16 points. And that was not nice, right? That was a bad feeling. A lot of the people in the media were tweeting all kinds of derogatory things about Michigan State football. To the point that Michigan State's former sports information director said, man, you know, he was getting texts from other SIDs from around the Big Ten saying, man, I can't believe your press corps. You're down two touchdowns in the first half and the press corps just dumping on these guys. Michigan State came back and won. Then they won 40 of their next 45, including that one. But winning that bowl, beating Minnesota, getting to a bowl game meant something to the fan base at that time. In the future, merely getting to one of those bowl games, will that mean less to a, to a fan base? I hope not. It probably will. But I do agree with those that say that the current college football playoff with only four teams and it being a closed club because there's a lot of dominant teams out there, you know, Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, Notre Dame a little bit. It's It's been hard to get into those four. And some people think that that has led to an exacerbation of the regionalization of college football. The entire West Coast cares less about college football now because they're not included. The back, the, the Big 12 is just barely included. Oklahoma's gotten in there a couple times, but quick exit. Texas hasn't been able to become a part of it. So with that dominance, it's, it's made it a regional sport, some people think. It, college football is big in the Midwest. It's not big in New England. It's dropping off the map on the West Coast. Do you do you want to fix that artificially by what, does expanding it, like Rick Neuheisel says? Will that make it more national again? Because you will have an Oregon or a USC involved in it. Maybe, but if they get blown out, it might not help. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of think that it will expand interest a little bit. It can't hurt right now because... There's decreasing interest right now. <clears throat> Some people think college football is becoming another NASCAR. I don't know. Spartan fan 1996 says, I hate to bring it up, and you might not want to talk about it, but is there any update on Ricky White? Thanks for everything. Update on Ricky White? No, no update. Not hearing a thing, and they're being quiet about it, which is interesting. I don't know. Matt from Ravenna, Michigan says, Jim, thanks for all your hard work. My question is, who do you think are the starters in the secondary next year, including the nickel position? Uh, nickel is going to be Michael Dowell, I would think. Darius Snow backing him up. Angelo Gross in the back with Xavier Henderson. The corners, I don't know. Let's go Kimbro, the guy from Florida, and the, the guy from Alabama. Forgot his name already. That's my guess. Kimbrough's been on the field a little bit more than the other guys. The guy from Alabama looks like a guy from Alabama. Question number nine, Beast Lansing. He says, do you believe Jared Horst will be a efficient, effective enough at offensive tackle to allow Kevin Jarvis to slide back into guard? Offensive guard. I think yes. I think Horst will be good enough for that. We talked about that in the last Spartan Mag Live. Going back over the, the – uh, 
the spring game, I thought Horst was solid. I thought he was effective, moved well. I think he'll be solid. I think he'll be good. He played left tackle in the spring game because our Curry was out with a little ailment. Not the Matrix, a little ailment. So does our Curry come back at left tackle and Horst go to right? Or does our Curry move to right? I don't know. But those two tackles, I think, got a chance to be solid, good, solid to good. And I think that allows Jarvis to move into guard. I thought Jarvis was functional at tackle, but I thought that he was not as good as Jordan Reed. Jordan Reed took a lot of criticism from people that expect offensive tackles to be perfect. Hey, Jordan Reed played through some pain and started, what, 20-plus straight games. And I thought they could have used him last year. He opted out. Now he's retired. As you know, Jordan Reed opted out. Kevin Jarvis moved from guard to tackle and had his struggles. Kevin Jarvis was a guy that was, I think, honorable mention all Big Ten as a true freshman and has had injury problems since then. Played last year, I think, all seven games. Was okay. Moving back to guard now as a senior, can Kevin Jarvis get back to an all Big Ten level at guard? I got to believe he can. I think Horst is good enough to give him that. You have to hope that Horst and Arcuri stay healthy and allow Jarvis to move back in. Your question is Horst going to be good enough to make it happen? Answer is yes. Question number 10, Ted, Chad from Ross Common, Michigan. Sorry, that thing kind of dis- disappears a little bit. He says, what can you divulge about Harold Joyner's first week in the strength and conditioning program? All right, I mentioned something about this on the message board earlier today, just that he'd been doing well, so he wants more details. All that I heard is that uh, that uh, dialing it back a few months, Kenneth Walker, the transfer running back from Wake Forest, really impressed the strength staff as soon as he arrived. Kenneth Walker really impressed the, the strength staff. And he was one of their favorites, still is one of their favorites. Then Harold Joyner came to town. And whereas Kenneth Walker was really impressive in the strength room, Harold Joyner was really, really, really impressive. They like both of them. And Harold Joyner can hold his own in there. So I can't give any more than that other than he, he came in and impressed right away. Now, that I heard that like two and a half weeks ago. So since then... Uh, Probably still doing it, but that that was a couple weeks ago. Just ability, commitment, all that stuff. But that's a guy, looks good. He's got to do it on the field. He's got to be a contact player. He's got to want to be tough. Takes more than just running and doing some great physical things because Joyner's got great physical gifts. Got to do it with the pads on. All right. By the way, Sun King says he's tuning in from Clark Lake, Michigan. Clark Lake, Michigan. I kind of lose this in the green screen a little bit. But that's way up north. That's way up north to the west. Clark Lake, Michigan. That's up over by Wisconsin. Ottawa National Forest. In the middle of the forest. That's like northwest of Green Bay. That's way up there. That's northwest of Iron Mountain. Clark Lake, Michigan. They're probably still wearing long johns up there. Is it no CM season up there yet? Black flies? Does the does the moose herd? There's a moose herd uh, around Marquette, and there's one around Newberry. Small. I don't know if the moose get that far south into the into the forest. They probably do because there's there's not much between there and the and, and Lake Michigan up there. There's there's not much. Not much man-made stuff. I gotta go. I've not been there in a long time. I need to go up there and just kind of prowl around a little bit. <clears throat> so he's watching from there. Also, AD Spartan says he's watching from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Question number eleven. Tobias Funk says, which Michigan State non-revenue sport has the capability to become a regular Big Ten slash national player? I I think you mean like a player for Big Ten championships and national accolades. Which non-revenue sport? That's that's, That's a lean crop right now. The answer is women's golf, women's cross country. Volleyball's done it. 
be- briefly before. Maybe they've got the ability because Big Ten is very good in volleyball, although this year in the NCAA tournament didn't turn out that way. I think Kentucky won the NCAA tournament in volleyball, which seems strange. Women's golf, Michigan State's good, and they've got more scholarships than the men's team does. I think Michigan State women's golf has more scholarships than the men's team. Men's team. So whereas Michigan State women's golf can compete for Big Ten championships, don't quite expect the same for the men. Don't hold them to the same standard. They don't have as much funding. Not sure if wrestling can get off the mat anytime soon. Pun intended. A lot of people would like them to, though. I like wrestling. Got tremendous respect for the sport of wrestling. I think it's awesome. It'd be great if Michigan State was good at it. Simply because I'd love to see some dual meets in a packed Jenison Fieldhouse with people just going crazy. You know those wrestling fans? They get crazy. You think hockey fans are crazy? You've been around wrestling fans at a packed house? Dude, that's what I want to see. I've never seen that at Michigan State. Never. I mean, it happened in the 60s, but... My frame of reference goes back to about 1986, and I've, uh, you know, not had the pleasure of experiencing that. That'd be great, but I don't know. I don't know what they need to get wrestling going again. The new coach, I think, you know, they they had that upset of Wisconsin a couple years ago, and they've they've had some moments of traction here and there. I don't know. I don't know what needs. I've not talked to him about it. I don't know what they need. I don't know if they've got it. I don't know if it's possible. But anyway, men's soccer, of course, went to the Final Four a couple years ago. That was nice. And Indiana, of course, is a perennial power there. And then you get some powers like Akron in soccer, men's soccer, but they really go heavily into the international players. Michigan State's not really done that. Women's golf, if you want to go heavy with international players, you could become a top 10 team. Michigan State usually has one or two, I think, but it becomes an institutional thing. Do you want to, as a land-grant university, stay closer to home with your scholarships? That's a philosophical thing. I think Michigan State women's golf has a good balance right now. Men's soccer, I think, has a good balance, too. Men's soccer could do what Akron does and load up with all international players, but I think they want to serve the state and the region. Nothing against international players, maybe a couple here and there, but they don't want to do like Akron. Nothing against Akron. Question number 12, Amos EO53 from Perrysburg, Ohio, says, I love Spartan Mag Live. Thank you, Amos. Says, I cannot always watch live, but I do watch them during the week during slow times. I think that's a compliment. No, I know. We appreciate it. We hope to have make the show good enough that you watch us during fast times. No, I don't got any blue oyster cult. Question is, with our interest in Nico Martial, what difference in play calling, preparation, etc., goes into having a left-handed quarterback join the team of right-handed throwers? <clears throat> That's a good question. Because if you've got one quarterback who's a lefty and the other ones are righties, does it alter the playbook a little bit? I've never had a coach tell me that, but I suspect that's true. Because if you're left hand, if you're right-handed, you're more likely going to favor this two-thirds of the field. Um, sometimes, depending on the coverage, this becomes the front side. You know, a lot of teams on offense will have this half of the field if they play in man-to-man, this half of its zone, or vice versa from play to play. And if it's man-to-man and they like a matchup. Maybe they, they put them over there for right-hander and they're expecting zone. They might want to you know, sit down over here with a slot, but they come out man-to-man. Now all of a sudden, your matchup advantage is over here. So for a right-hander, that might not be the best, but it'll change depending on the read. But I think that that... Uh, I think it would be just a, I think that I think the the I, I think there would be but you know what if you, you go into a game with Rocky Lombardi and Peyton Thorne last year you've got your playlists for you know first and tens first and fifteens if you have a penalty third and long third and manageable you've got a list of plays that you want to get to I suspect they had different 
that there, were, there was a different sheet for Lombardi at quarterback and a different sheet for Thorne. They might be slightly different. And that's a couple of right-handers. Um, if it's a right-hander or left-hander, they're going to have their own sheets also. So even if you have two right-handers, they're going to have different sheets. But to your point, I do think that the other half of the field would get favored. Now, John L. Smith said he preferred left-handed quarterbacks because he liked his quarterbacks to be right-lobed in the brain. And his first left-handed quarterback, he got the transfer from Florida, Johnson, right? Was it Brad Johnson? What was his name? No, Reeves, Stephen Reeves. He's a lefty. Didn't work out so good. Drew Stanton beat him out. And Stephen Reeves, he had a curious completion percentage in high school. I think in high school, his completion percentage was like 48%. It's like, whoa, that doesn't seem right. Came to Michigan State and had problems. That's the only left-hander he had. All right. Question number 13, MSU Spartans 777 asks this question. Who is the fastest player on the Michigan State football team? My answer was, I don't know, Jalen Naylor. And I posed that question out to an insider who should know. And the answer I got back was, I don't know, Jalen Naylor. So that's the answer. Will it change this year? I think it could. Although I don't know who might be the best candidate to do that. I don't know. But Naylor. We'll go with Naylor. Uh, question number 14. Powell from deep in left field, he says, can you touch on the MSU baseball situation? Checking my messages here to make sure we're still on the air. And we are. Good. Uh, MSU baseball situation. Ooh, rough season this year. What were they? 17 to 27 all games against Big Ten opponents. And then news came out that, what, 9, 10, 11 players are entering the portal. Um, there's been some scuttlebutt out there that, you know, there was some, there's some uh, discontent. So these players are leaving. So he, uh, Powell is asking, uh, can you, any names on the players are leaving? No, I don't have names on who's leaving. And he asks, is the Michigan State administration aware of the behind-the-scenes drama? And I would have to say, if they weren't, they have to be aware of it now. Because I'm guessing some Michigan State baseball boosters and donors and maybe parents and followers have probably emailed administration administrative people and said, uh, what's going on here? I don't know. It's uh, Things are difficult over there. Things are difficult. Andy in Caledonia says, does Michigan State have a plan for name, image, and likeness? It seems like the state of Michigan is behind other states. Any talk of this? Uh, plans, I know Michigan State for recruiting, that is part of the recruiting pitch, plans that they have to help players promote themselves and so forth, much to Tom Izzo's chagrin. Izzo had an interesting comment a couple of weeks ago. He said, I spent a couple of years telling our players to stay off of Twitter. Now for name, image, and likeness, part of the recruiting pitch is to show them how to make their brand bigger on Twitter. So Izzo's like, wow. What the hell? What the hell? Uh, you know, at the federal level, it doesn't look like anything's going to be done about name, image, and likeness before the end of the summer. So state laws, which are going into effect soon, will become the law of the land <clears throat> in those states. And... And borders extended, I think, although I, I don't have a great handle on how law works. Those kind of laws. Um, so I don't think there's anything in the books that would preclude a student athlete who's a citizen of Michigan from beginning to generate money via social media. And that's going to be happening in the South, possibly in the next few months. From there, can they start to do commercials? Again, I, you know, I don't know if, if you want to be the first athlete to do it because would it really be worth it if you're Gabe Brown and Quality Dairy is going to give you $11,000 to do a billboard and a couple of commercials? You do it, and then the NCAA says, wait a minute, can't do that yet. It's legal in Georgia and Alabama, but it's not legal in Michigan. NCA is not going to not going to touch that. 
I don't know. Do you want to be the first one to go out there and be the curt flood of the situation and possibly lose a year of eligibility? Maybe not. That's for an $11,000 deal to Quality Dairy. Now, some of those guys with big social media followings can make that money on the side a little bit more clandestine, in a more clandestine way. Did I use that properly? If Konerdijk was here, he'd tell me. Uh, so there's going to be some players making money in social media. There could be some players that run into tax problems, <laughs> which is a good pl- problem to have. Uh, Atlanta Spartan, who's really plugged in nicely with national media, was talking about players and athletes that have big social media f- followings would have and would have the potential to bring in good money, big money in social media. And most of the ones with the most potential are female athletes, college female athletes. There's a few of them. There was one, there was a softball player at Oregon that had over a million followers on Instagram. She happens to be an attractive human being. That probably helps. So I don't doubt that your top money producers in earnings, social media earnings in college sports, it's not going to be the quarterback at Alabama. It's going to be like a a pitcher for UCLA softball or a gymnast at Georgia or something like that. Just a guess. All right, let's go over here to the comments area. Terrence says, hope everybody, everyone is well. Good to have those thoughts from Terrence. Ron Warner says, go green from the Oop. Let's see. I think I backed up a little bit. Let me, let me see if I can find my place. Another question from Nick Harrington. I think Nick called. He says, how do you, uh, how much do you think the Bo allegations will affect Michigan recruiting? Has anyone seen Joyner play? Harold Joyner, you know, there, he had a couple of highlights with Auburn last year, and he, he had one long touchdown. He looks good when he's got the ball in his hands in open field. The toughness thing needs to show there. He says there's like zero film on him, and he was not at the spring. Yeah, if you can find film of him if you go back and look at old games that are on YouTube. I think there might be some Auburn games on YouTube. You can find him. I, I did that when he committed, but I've not looked at them recently. Big, tall guy with athletic ability. Uh, change of direction, maybe not so much. I don't know. Jacob Terry says, talking about Arizona State. Uh, he says, Mark Hall is going to take his official visit to Arizona State this weekend, but what the hell happened to Arizona State today? Is that going to affect their recruiting going forward if those allegations are true? Uh, You probably heard it. Arizona State, it's been revealed. The NCAA is investigating Arizona State on, I think, recruiting improprieties. I don't know if it was recruiting improprieties or just violations of generic generic violations. I don't know what it was. I was stunned to see the NCAA still has somebody – with their ear to the ground on those things. Don't they have work to do with Arizona? LSU? With that FBI thing from a few years ago that just kind of went away? Seriously, I'm, I, I, I'd, hear, I'd heard that NCAA just like doesn't feel like they can even handle investigations anymore. They're waiting to just be like turned into the NAIA. Or the AAU. Or the AFL. Or the WHA. I don't know. So, Arizona State will hurt the recruiting. I don't know. Probably a little bit. <clears throat> Does that affect Markiel? Maybe. But I think he's headed to West Virginia. Brad Vashenko says, Pac-12 coaches are signing, are singing to the NCAA regarding Herm Edwards. Okay. I've not heard that. Interesting. Jesse Adams says, Jesse from Mount Pleasant, glad to see the live is back. I think you can tell tell what Mel Tucker wants. Long offensive linemen that have some athletic guys with bend and flexibility. Am I wrong on that? No, you're right. 
Tall guy, 6'7", 300, 6'6", 300. You would think, yeah, that's what everybody wants. But there's not meant, there's not like an infinite number of those guys out there. Michigan State's had trouble getting those type of guys. But this year, this class, they got those type of guys. What do you know? This year in the state of Michigan, there was one of those type of guys. And it was Lepo from Grand Haven. I mean, Pruitt is okay, and Landers can do some things, but they're not those 6'6 offensive tackle types, square body, long arms, move, you know, strong upper bodies, lateral movement. Lepo maybe, but not a lot in the state of Michigan. So that's what he likes. They went out and got a couple. Got to give him credit on that. Nick Harrington says also, I know it's kind of soon. Any chance our hockey team will have a pulse this year? Well, two hockey questions. I didn't do my hockey uh, hockey homework before the show this week. You know, like I said, I thought they were going to be pretty good last year. I don't know. They'll be a year more experienced on the on, on defense. Got some help in the portal. But I, I'll have to ask around. I'll to talk to my, my buddy Neil Kepke, see what he knows. I'll talk to Jerbear, see what he knows. I asked Jerbear a little bit a few weeks ago, and he thought they were recruiting over the heads of some current players, which is a good sign. But I don't think anyone's holding their breath right now about cracking the top two in the Big Ten anytime soon, at least not this year. But um, sometimes there's surprises. I'll have to look into that one more closely. Erline Wren says, I'm glad the Spartans are recruiting outside the state of Michigan because most of the people in the in Michigan are going to play childish games with the Spartans. We don't need to play those games, says Erline Wren. All right. Jesse Adams says, my second question is, how do you think Michigan State is sitting with Curly Thomas out of Texas? Keep up the great work. Uh, Curly Thomas, good defensive end from Fort Worth, Texas, visited Michigan State last week, liked it more than he thought he would. He kind of saw himself as California Golden Bears or Texas Tech. He had Michigan State in there a little bit, but he wasn't real big on coming up to a bad weather place to play football. And his dad told him, hey, go check it out. Go check it out. You might like it. Go check it out. So Curly Thomas was like, oh, yeah, go check it out. He came and checked it out, and he's like, man, this place is great. Of course, he saw it in June. Uh, He liked it. His mom and dad liked it. He liked it a lot. I asked him, did you consider committing on your visit? And he said, it's hard not to. It was that special. So now I'll have a couple weeks off. He's supposed to visit Purdue and Oklahoma State. I think one was supposed to be a midweek visit right now. I'll have to text him to see if he took the visit or not. He told me on Sunday he wasn't sure. He had three visits left, Oklahoma State, Purdue, Texas Tech. I asked him, which of those three visits are you most likely to take? And he said, Texas Tech. And that's the last one. It's his home state. Michigan State still has some work to do there. How hard is Texas Tech going after him? Pretty hard. So it's going to be a tough one. I'm not sure he knows where he's going to go yet. So that's where that one is. Brad Fashenko says Carter equals Thomas Tyree for those who go back to the mid-80s. All right. Brad Fashenko, Don Strait, thanks once again for your support. Angelo Gross, Harold Joyner, enthusiast. Says, all right, that says very light audio. That's when we were going through the audio portion problem of the program. All right. Robert Suter says, keep your hands off the mic. Got it. Gordon Tenona says, what happened to Max Barr? Uh... I think COVID, it was it was going through some transitions. I last time I drove by there, I looked on the sign and there were no there was nothing on the sign. So I'm I'm assuming it's closed. I thought it was still in business as of a year and a half ago before COVID. <clears throat> I thought not that I frequent there anymore, not since the late '80s. Uh, it had gone from you know you, you know in the '80s, those of you that are my age remember there was just like a legendary jukebox type of sing along, just uh, drunken revelry type of place. There'd be spillage on the floor. They called it the Max Muck. Um, sanitation might not have been their strong suit at the old Max Bar. Uh, I loved it for what it was. <clears throat> and then 
I don't know, 20 years later became kind of a, a band bar because there were fewer places, fewer venues in downtown East Lansing for bands to play, especially traveling bands from outside of town, like from out-of-state bands. You know, back in the 80s and previously, bands would go on the Big Ten circuit. You know, they'd load up the bus, they go to Champaign on Wednesday night, they go to Bloomington on Thursday night, they might East Lansing on Saturday night, Ann Arbor on Sunday night, and they did, you know, there was, there was a circuit. That doesn't really exist anymore because, I don't know, kids don't play music anymore, I guess. I don't know. That's one of the big, I, I've not had that explained to me. How you can have a campus of 45,000 students and you can't tell me that you can't put together a decent Zeppelin cover band out of, some, out of three or four guys or girls. And you can't tell me that, they, that if they played at Ricks that people wouldn't show up to, to listen to it? <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know. I've not had that explained to me properly. I think we've got a better handle on the the planetary extinction of 65 million years ago than we do on live band extinction on college campuses. Um, so, you know, back in the old days, you'd have bands at Rick's Small Planet. <clears throat> Once in a while, downstairs at Dooley's. But Rick's was the main place, right? Small Planet gave us a competition for a while. On a good night, both would be going in the late 80s, early 90s. And those two went in different directions. Small Planet no longer in existence. <clears throat> Rick's is still there, but it's like DJs and stuff like that, I guess. I don't know. I don't go in there. I don't know. I will say I snuck in there 12 years ago when we were having a birthday party when somebody turned 40. And went and saw Star Farm there, and they were, they were very entertaining. But since then, I don't think there's any bands playing in the last 5, 10 years. Uh, but you'd go by Max, and there would be like, you'd look on the the marquee, and it would, three, four years ago, there'd be like three bands listed. And they'd be very creative names to bands, sometimes two bands. I, I don't know, they're playing two bands, three bands? I don't know how that works. Give each of them 15 bucks? I don't know how that works. I assume that's what it was. I did see a band at Max Bar probably 15 years ago. I haven't been back. You know, I'm not going to go in there. If I've got a good reason to go in there, like people are in town want to go do something stupid, yeah, but I'm not just like as a regular going to go in there. That'd be ridiculous. But you know I'd like to. But no, Max Bar is shut down. All right. Uh, Don Strait asking people to hit the thumbs up. Thanks, Don. Thumbs up would be good. Brad Fischenko says something else. Brad's right. Hit and miss is generous. Can't remember what I was talking about with hit and miss. Oh, offensive lineman, I think. Correct. Old Tuck says, Cobb, tell a, Cobb, tell a good Blaha story. I've seen him get comfortable in Dagwood. Seems like a good guy. He is a good guy, man. I like Blaha. I like him a lot. He's a swell dude. I, I just like Blaha. Well-dressed, professional. I like when he gets to November and he starts showing up with that Paul Brown hat. Showing up at the game. <clears throat> I said, George, where'd you get that hat? That hat is sweet. And he said, someplace in Southfield. The Hatter? Something the Hatter? Um, blah. Good guy. Talks recruiting with me a little bit when I see him. Blah, you know, dude. I mean, when I was in seventh grade, Pistons drafted Isaiah and Trapuca. Got better when I was like in ninth grade. Around this time of year, I'd be out on the patio pl practicing my jab step and my crappy 18-foot jumper from the top of the key with a patio with a light on, listening to the Pistons. And I'd been you know, working on my game all day, trying not to be any worse than I already was. And I the Pistons would be playing. You know, I, I'm trying to get some shots up, whatever. Turn the Pistons on. And invariably, I'd just start, I would, you know, I'm in eighth grade. I'm a stupid kid, right? And whatever they, whatever Blaha was describing on the radio, I would try to be that player and try to do what they're doing, whether it be Vinnie Johnson or Bill Lambeer or whatever. I might have told Blaha that once. He thought that was funny, I think. But, yeah, Blaha, that's my, my Blaha. Childhood memories go back to the Pistons when they were just getting started. Um... I don't have any good ones, but thanks. I, I I know I've got some. I just don't have any any coming to me. Most of my Blaha mem 
stories or just me saying, hey, how you doing, George? And whatever he says, I just shut up and listen. I got great respect for him. And he is incredibly nice and professional and a perfectionist. He's from Gaylord, Old Tuck says. I don't know who's is. I don't know who he says is from Gaylord. Uh, Andrew Backus says, did you answer the name, image, and likeness question yet? Nope, I just got to that. Yeah, I did a few minutes ago. Noah says, Andrew, he made a long post on name, image, and likeness over on the underground bunker. You should check it out. I think he's talking about the Atlanta, our, our friend from Atlanta, our media expert. Keith Tunstall says Keeler was injured in the last two years. Keeler was a monster. I forgot about that. Keeler played hurt in 16 when Michigan State was going through that miserable season. Keeler played hurt, played through it, and did his best. He did everything he could. Noah says, I assume Noah says, I assume Gavin Brocious could definitely slide over to the center if needed. Yeah, I've heard that. I've not I've not asked around specifically about that. Brocious Maybe he's built more like that. Maybe he's built less like a tackle than the others. So if you're built less like a tackle, you're more like a guard. And if you're a guard, you're a candidate to play center is the way that works. Matthew Johnson says, light as day out in Muskegon County. That was probably in, that's, you know, an hour ago now, but that's good. When I said that, it was darkness was falling on East Lansing, but further west... Sun stays out a little longer. Good for you guys. Old Tuck, the Harbaugh family doctor. Old Tuck says he either enabled or something else. Old Tuck says the AD Graham something mentioned mentioned Bo after thanking his wife at the introductory presser. All right. I'm not following you there. Jacob Terry says, I'm sure Harbaugh has them on. I'm not going to. Uh, okay, on kneelers at the footsteps of a classic oil painting of Bo in all his glory. Probably right. I, I don't know what that says. I might have re- said something there very offensive, but I'm not sure. I didn't mean to. Cameron Trigg says, how's our chances with Tatum? Dylan Tatum, defensive back from West Bloomfield High School, Michigan and Michigan State. Josh Hemmel just posted a story about Dylan Tatum from down in uh, the Rivals five-star challenge in Atlanta, which is going on this weekend. And he posted it earlier today, and I've not read it yet. If you'd like to, I can read it along with all of you right now, like a, like a children's book in the kindergarten. No, I'll just go straight to the quotes. Tatum says, it's definitely a very difficult decision. They're both top programs. I just love both staffs. Yeah, you know, I'll have to read this a little bit more. Uh, this quote. Dylan Tatum, it was really comfortable because we. All right, he says, uh, Michigan State, they've done a great job with me. I really loved the entire campus this past weekend, and my family loves it. I saw Dylan Tatum interacting with Trey Mosley. Mosley's from West Bloomfield also. His parents and his current high school coach. Quotes, he says, Trey Mosley, that's my guy. We hung, we hung out this past weekend, took some pictures together, and it was very fun. He loves it there, and he's a great leader. He said, school-wise, it's not too hard, but it's not too easy. Just do what you're supposed to do, and you'll be fine. Um, besides that, Michigan State coaches and his former teammates. Tatum also has a family member that's rooting for him, for him to be a Spartan. Quote, my little sister comes up to me at the end and said, Dylan, Michigan State has my vote. That was at the end of uh, their visit. He talks about his relationship with the clink scale. Um, I had it at 50-50. I'm going to say 53% Michigan now. I just, I'll just i believe it when I see it if he goes Michigan State. And I'll believe it when I see it if he stays Michigan State. Good kid. Wish him the best. I just... I, just, uh, I think... Uh, I just... I, 
I had it at 50-50 after seeing him on Sunday at the camp, but I wasn't there when he said those things, but those things sound like someone who's not going to pick Michigan State. It's like giving him all the honorable mentions, kind of. Uh, that quote about it not being too hard, it's kind of interesting. Just do what you're supposed to do. Well, at least they're having them do something. Which, not sure if that's the case in other places. But, uh, it's an interesting quote. Interesting quote. Uh, yeah, Tom said we're up to 50-50 with the VCATs on Sunday. Yeah, I got 50-50. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scale it back. I'm going to flip it back toward Michigan at 52-48. And not just because of those quotes, just... A little bit of vibes since the weekend. I think he's given Michigan State every opportunity, and I think he likes it. But I just don't. I just uh, I have to believe it when I see it. Rodney says, glad to see Comp back. It's great to be seen. Irvin says any word, or Nick Heritage says any word on Irvin Jr. Talking about Cedric Irvin Jr.? I see he's taking some high-profile visits. Haven't heard, but he's going to be coming to Michigan State soon. Let me see here. I think I've got some notes on him. Oh, I didn't record him. I'll find out, but yeah, I think he's going to be coming up pretty soon. Rob South finally checking in. Bjorn Charlie says, take the recruits out to Lake Lansing next year. Yeah, Lake Lansing's okay. It's probably not quite what they had in West Virginia. Hayden Vischer says, give comps some thumbs up. Thanks, Hayden. Noah says, I'm all for country music references. Keep them coming. Check out Noah. Noah's a college student. He likes, He's a college student in the state of Michigan. Southeast Michigan, as a matter of fact. And he likes the country music references who knew looks like Hayden Vischer agrees uh, Spartan MD says B-Flow is the best I don't know what, I, don't, I don't know what that means Hayden Vischer says rumor has it Mel can sell a steak to a vegetarian someday he might get to that level I agree Jacob Terry says the new facilities will really Help Michigan State close the doors on these higher-rated guys in the future. Okay. Uh, Spartan MD says, thank you for these broadcasts. Thank you. And Spartan MD with a super sticker. Thanks a lot, Spartan MD. Appreciate it. All right. You, it looks like you gave me like one of these, but it just came up in verbiage form. Noah says, what do we consider up north? Question mark. Anything above Mount Pleasant? Now that's going to set off a bunch of discussions. Uh, up north, I know I know this. It's, uh, it's everything up north of here. Because when you get right here, when you get to uh, north of Mount Pleasant, not quite. You have to get a little further than that, up to Clare. Because if you're on uh, 127, when you get to Claire, the trees start to change. It's a different climate zone. You start getting more birch trees, and then you start getting some jack pines. The forest changes right here, and it goes from about Claire over to Pinconning. Everything north of there is up north. And I don't know what the border is over there on 131 out toward Grand Rapids. Some of you can help me. Maybe over by... Let me see here. North of Howard City, north of Hesperia. 131, let's see here. I know how important this is to everybody. But this 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 starts fights sometimes. So north of Stanwood, north of Big Rapids, we're on 131. When you get into Reed City, Reed City would probably be about it. A little bit north of Grand of Big Rapids. Because that's about the same plane as Claire, which is about the same plane as Pinconning. That's your answer. Pinconning, Claire for sure, and then Reed City. 
Reed City in the middle over there, the Manistee National Forest, all the way over to Ludington. I'm not sure. You people have to tell me. I think Pentwater would probably be up north when you go over on the coast, on the west coast, on the Lake Michigan close. Ludington for sure. So Pentwater is south of Clare a little bit, and it's south of Pinconning, but something's telling me that Pentwater, if you're going up one, if you're going up 31 along the coast, that would be it. So that, that's your answer. And I'll take, I'll take no discussion on that. We will have no discussion on that. I'm sure discussion will come, will show up here, but that's my, uh, that's my definition and I won't be swayed. Up north is north of West Branch, says Spartan MD. Yeah, West Branch would be up by, if you go up I-75, it's West Branch. Up 127, it's Clare. Up 23, it's Pinconning. And up along the coast, I'm guessing it's Pentwater. Noah says, Damon Rensing is a very good coach. I agree with that. Alex James says, agreed or Claire. It can be Claire. Claire or West Branch. They're two different things. They are they're coplanar. They're not one above the other. They're coplanar. Spartan MD says, any chance for the new football recruits that they also play basketball to actually see the hardwood? Uh, you know, Chase Carter, I doubt it. You know, if... If he were to play basketball and get on get some playing time, that would mean that Michigan State needs him. And I don't see Michigan State basketball needing him. Trey Holloman, if he plays football at Michigan State, could he be a guy that helps in basketball? Very hard to do. I mean, if you're going to be a basketball player, or you know, Malik Carr, possibly. But if you're going to be – you have to be a football player that dabbles in basketball in the second half of the basketball season. That's the only way to make it work. And – I mean, Rocket Watts probably didn't work on his game enough. And you saw what kind of shooter he was. And he's been a very good scorer in high school. Andre Risen was a very, very good high school basketball player. But when you only practice basketball for three, four months a year, Andre Risen was not a good shooter when he played for Heathcote's team. Did a lot of other things pretty well. If he had focused on basketball only, Heathcote thinks Risen could have been an NBA player. But you just don't roll out of the bed and go play IM basketball as if you're playing IM basketball. You know, guys that play college basketball at a high level, the work that they put in, the work that they put in in order to become a Matt McQuaid, to become a Cassius Winston, to become a Travis Walton, I mean, is shooting, 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 you know, drills, 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 just to keep your head above water to become functional and then good. Football players don't have time to do that. So if you're going to be a football player playing basketball, you're going to be a role player. You're going to play defense, you're going to rebound, and you're not going to be asked to shoot unless it's garbage shots. Matt Trannon, Julius Peppers. Remember when Art Schleister played basketball? It's hard to tell how good he actually was because you don't know if he had some action going. We don't know. But, no, uh, Malik Carr, you know, he released some video of him doing some stuff in an open gym. And yeah, he can run and dunk and do some things, but there are offensive things with the ball. If he's going to get on the court to help in football, it's going to be away from the basketball. So Carr, I think, might have a chance if he wants to pursue that. But I think Michigan State might be too good. They won't need him. You know, other players have tried it. Was it Deion Sims tried it? Or no? Uh, you know, Aaron Alexander did briefly. There have been some others. You know, Lorenzo Guess. There have been others here and there. Trannon was the one that had the biggest impact, right? So Noah says, as an Oakland County guy, anything north of Clarkston is up north. That is incorrect, Noah. Anything north of Clarkston is not up north. Paige Bukers at UConn. Yeah, she she has like a million viewers, a million followers on Instagram. Alex James says, sounds like Arizona State coaches were hosting and contacting recruits during the dead period. Okay. Yeah, I can see the NCAA saying, dude, you can't. All right, okay. We, NCAA is going to be like, look, we don't really exist anymore, but come on, Arizona State. You can't do that. Noah says, Max Barr is temporarily closed. Okay, hopefully they'll come back. I'd like to do this show from Max Barr one night. 
and open for Goober and the Peas. That's what I'd like to do. Blong John says, Ricks, the Hannibals, always a good time. And Fat Amy, can't forget about them. Or Bob Harvey. You said Boo Harvey, but you meant Bob Harvey. And Bob Harvey, the correct spelling of Bob Harvey is like this. You should know that. Being part of the business. Uh, what else you got there? Bob Harvey was good. They were kind of a reggae thing. Pat Amy was good with Bob Guinea on lead vocals. They had a good version of Round Here by County Crows. I saw one night back in the mid-90s. Hannibal's, 19 Wheels, The Toll. What else you got? Red Hot Chili Peppers, you may have heard of them. They were on the circuit then. Water for the Pool, Jay Walker and the Pedestrians. What else you got? Uh, I don't know. Groove Spoon. The Small Planet was phenomenal. Going Public. Groove Spoon. Going Public was not my thing. Henry the Hatter. That's it. Rob South. Henry the Hatter in Southfield. That's where Blaha got his hat. Ramiro says, I'm tuning in from Jalisco, Mexico. I went into a distillery yesterday to get a contact, and a woman came out from the back. We started talking, and then come to find out, we are both from southwest Detroit. Don Ramiro says, she grew up blocks from me and spoke perfect English. Don Ramiro, putting in some time. Good to see you, Ramiro. God bless you. Hope you're doing great. Noah says, Jim, you posted a name, image, and likeness thread about two weeks back. Yes, I did. Old Tuck, Paul Revere's was a good place to get a mug of beer, too. Spartan MD says, Tatum's older sister is a Spartan, by the way. Old Tuck says, Dagwoods is the top bar in the area. Olive Burger, cold beer, big time watering hole. You know, I've not been to Dagwoods in a long time. I might need to go in there. I used to get my mail there, says Old Tuck. Hayden Vischer says, those general studies degrees, sheesh, tough stuff. Hayden Vischer, Baldwin. Baldwin. Baldwin is an up north border. Pentwater says Old Tuck. And Old Tuck is a West Coast Michigan Lake Michigan guy. And he would know. And he's gonna say Pentwater. And I'm 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 gonna I'll defer to him on that. And I'm I don't cruise up that way enough, but I do the Claire to Grayling thing, and I do the Pinconning to Alpina thing, and I do the Flint to West Branch thing. So I can vouch for Pinconning, West Branch, Claire. But I will defer to Old Tuck, my Lake Michigan coast guy from the Seaway Conference, that Pentwater is the up north border on the sunset side of the state. Reed City says Old Tuck. Okay. And I was just trying to get to that when you arrived at it. Pinconning, pincher. Don't know what that means. Brad Fashenko says, Andre Ray at Ryzen, very good baseball player. Played against him many times in Summer League in Flint. Check that out. I did not know that. And I don't doubt it. Bob Harvey, see that? Doors Fan 91 says, would love to give Tatum, would love to get Tatum, but more, but was more a fan when they were thinking offense with him. Defensive backs can be found. Game breakers at running back or the slot are tougher to find. Good point. Okay, Blong John blaming it on his iPhone to iPhone typing for having the incorrect spelling style of Bob Harvey. Okay, you're excused. Bob Harvey was on the Conan O'Brien show once, by the way. He, like years after they did the East Lansing thing. I was like, Bob Harvey still still alive? Called a couple people. The dude did it. He sang the front the lead singer, don't know what his name is. He sat on like a a, a king's throne and, and sang. While he sat. It's an interesting choice. Zach Ninehouse says, any feeling if we have a chance with Hauser? Yeah, I mean, Hauser's visiting this weekend. He's committed to Boise State. But if he's visiting, they got a chance. Old Tuck says, you were right about Reed City Cop. Thanks, Old Tuck. And on that note, we're going to wrap up the latest edition of Spartan Mag Live. Hoping to be back soon. Part of it's going to be depend on, on my baseball problem. I've got a baseball problem. It's an addiction. It's a situation. Working on it. 
maybe Sunday. Sunday's Father's Day, right? I got some, I got some meetings that night. I don't know. Tournaments. Maybe next Monday, we'll give it another shot. Couldn't do it this Monday. We had practice. So we'll give it a shot next week. Got a recruiting is hot and heavy for Michigan State right now. We have our ear to the ground over at SpartMag.com. Become a member. Become a subscriber. Go over there. Get in the know. Have some fun also. And you get to lock horns with people like Old Tuck and have a good time with it. Everybody, thanks for coming in. Thanks for the personal sponsorships. Thanks for your support. And uh, go check out SpartanMag.com. Become a subscriber. You will thank us for it later. Be a magger. It's a, it's a great thing to do. It's a great place to be. SpartanMag.com. My name is Jim Coproni. Thanks for joining in. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.